Good morning, welcome to Catalyst and our Sunday online service. If you're joining us today for the first time, I'm John Murray, lead pastor of Catalyst Vineyard Church in Ithaca, New York. And today, we are on part five of our 12-week summer series entitled Faithful, Fueling Your Faith in a World on Empty. And if you've been with us, you know we're using two resources for this series. The first is Kyle Eidelman's book, Don't Give Up, written in 2019. The second is the book of Hebrews in the New Testament scriptures. And that author is unknown. But we've said that it's clear that he was constantly talking about faith and actually how to be full of faith. And we've been reading from Hebrews 12.1 that says this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great or a huge cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders, let go of every wound that has pierced us and the sin that so easily entangles. And what this author is basically saying is, hey, therefore, given what we just read about in chapter 11, all these big name faith heroes, we should keep heed or listen to the voices of what they would be saying to us. And so we listen to the voice of Abraham in the first message and how he would be saying to us, you need to keep believing, don't give up. Or we would listen to the voice of Jacob, who in the second message, we said that he would say to us, keep fighting. In fact, he had an all night wrestling match with God to get a new name, to be blessed with a new name, Israel. And he would say, keep fighting, don't give up. And we also said that there's another group that are sort of the no-name faith heroes. In Hebrews 11, 35 to 38, it says of them that there were others, and these others were persecuted. They were imprisoned, and um, they actually lacked clothing. They didn't even have a place to sleep. They were martyred. But it would say if we listened to them, we would hear them say, keep perspective. Don't give up. In other words, you need to bear in mind other people have gone through things similar to or maybe greater than you have. And then we also have talked about this word, everything that hinders. And last week we began with that and we said there's actually going to be four messages we're doing. The first of which, which was last week. And these four messages are these. Everything that hinders being anxiety, religion, lies, and unbelief. And last week we talked about unhindered by anxiety. And we said the fact that Peter had basically said to us, you need to cast your cares. You need to throw your anxiety on God. You need to humble yourself. You need to admit that you need his help, and then you need to cast your weight on him. And we also said that Paul said that we should be anxious about nothing, but in everything give thanks. And we said David was our example for that because David constantly would be doing self-talk where he would be saying things like, I'm, I'm in trouble. I'm in big, big trouble. I'm surrounded by my enemies, and yet I believe in God. He would say, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, yet thou art with me. And, and that's the kind of, of praise, that's the kind of thanksgiving, that's the kind of humbling that helps us to throw or cast that weight of anxiety on God. And today, we are going to go to the next message in this message about casting hindrances or throwing hindrances on God. In today's message, we're going to be talking about religion. But first, our Catalyst worship team is going to lead us in two songs of worship, and then I'll be back to share today's message, which is Unchained from Religion. stars they wept the morning sun was dead the savior of the world was falling his body on the cross his blood poured out for us the weight of every curse upon him Love could not be overcome. 
So if you read Kyle Eidelman's book, Don't Give Up, there's a word you're going to read about, a phenomena, and it's called institutionalization. And it's interesting, that word refers to prisoners who, when they're put in prison for an extended period of time, they begin to become very comfortable in prison. And in fact, when they're finally set free, they actually don't know how to live free. And it causes them to actually do things to go back to prison. And a friend of mine who's been in prison and in and out of prison said that it's, it's very real because you get comfortable in prison. You get comfortable with everything being controlled in your environment. And then you get in a different environment. You go back to a, a world that you're no longer used to. And you tend to have become, in a sense, a prisoner to prison. And so one of the things that, that they share in Eidelman's book that I really love is the movie, The Shawshank Redemption. And if you've seen that movie, you know that there's an individual by the name of Red, and, and that's played by Morgan Freeman. And, and Red has been in jail for a long time, so he's been a prisoner for a long time. And here's how he explains institutionalization to the other prisoners. He said this, I am telling you, these walls are funny. First you hate them, then you get used to them. Enough time passes, and you get so you depend on them. It doesn't mean you like them. It doesn't even mean you want them. But you get used to them. And then enough time passes and you actually begin to depend on them. And in a sense, this institutionalization, this inability to live free once you're set free, it was an experience of the first century Jesus followers that actually the author of Hebrews was writing to. Because he recognized that these first century Jesus-following Jews had been set free from the law through what Jesus had done. And yet, they struggled to detach themselves from using the law as a way to be right with God. They, they had a hard time not trying harder and doing better to be right with God. They had a hard time actually looking at the sacrifice of Jesus and accepting it as having fully made them right with God. They actually were carrying what we would call the weight of religion. And this weight that they were carrying is actually described by Jesus in Matthew 23. And he's talking to the crowd, but he's also talking to the religious leaders that were there, the Pharisees, and the people that were the lawmakers or the teachers of the law. And here's what it says. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees are the official interpreters of the law of Moses. Jesus knew that they were the ones who had been trained to teach the Mosaic law, to teach the law of Moses. And he said, so practice and obey whatever they tell you. He didn't say the law was bad. He said, but don't follow their example. Don't do as they do, for they don't practice. They don't do what they teach. They don't do what they say. They crush people. They tie on their backs heavy burdens with unbearable religious demands. And then they never lift a finger to ease this burden. And so basically what, what is being spoken here is the fact by the author of, of Hebrews, he's saying, you know what? These people will burn you and, and then they won't help take this off. And Jesus then saying, these people will burn you and they won't help take this weight off. And if you read in Hebrews, from the very beginning, from chapter 1, the author begins to say this. He begins to say that Jesus is God's final word. In fact, he says not, he, not only his final word, Jesus is superior. Basically, Jesus is better. Jesus is better than the prophets in the Old Testament. Jesus is better than the religious leaders of that day. Jesus is better than the angels. Jesus is better than even Moses, who was the one who led us out of the wilderness, who, who took us out of captivity in Egypt for 400 years. Jesus is better than the high priests that sacrifice for our sins. Jesus is actually, his law is actually better than the Mosaic law. His, his new law, his new commandment, where he said love one another, that's actually more encompassing and gets the job done better. And actually Jesus' covenant is a better covenant. The new covenant that he cut, that he talked about in his blood, that covenant is better than the Mosaic covenant. And basically the author is saying, there's something brand new that's happened and you need to recognize it's better and you need to be willing to let go of what's old. You need to be willing to put it on the shelf. And in fact, in Hebrews 8, the author basically says this. He says, the old covenant is obsolete. It's no longer in effect. It's no longer the pathway to be right with God. And in saying all that, he's basically saying, 
there's something new. There, there, there's a new sheriff in town. Jesus has brought something brand new. And I think many of us who have been raised in church environments, we've been raised maybe a Catholic or a Baptist, you know, or maybe a Pentecostal. What often happens is the people who are leading us in religion tend to add weights. They tend to put things on our backpack that Jesus never intended to be there. They tend to do the same thing that Jesus was talking about when he spoke about the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. They, they add things to what's supposed to be the main thing. And a great example is that is if you read the Ten Commandments, commandment number four is this, honor the Sabbath. But you know what? The Pharisees and the teachers of the law, they actually added to that. The Pharisees added this to that. They, they basically said, well, when it says to honor the Sabbath, here's what honor looks like. Honor looks like this. You cannot walk more than seven-tenths of a mile. Now, that wasn't in the Mosaic Law, but they added to that. In other words, you take one step further than seven-tenths of a mile, you're now working, and now you're breaking the Sabbath. You're not resting on the Sabbath. Or if you have a donkey and you, you get off of that donkey and you take the saddle off the donkey, now you're working and you're breaking the Sabbath, and, and you're violating that. And then even maybe the one that, that really, to me, is, is the most ridiculous of all is this, is if you're going to have an egg on the Sabbath, you better not have an egg that's been laid by a hen on the Sabbath, because that hen was at work on the Sabbath, and therefore you're at work on the Sabbath. I mean, how crazy is that? And if any of you have been watching the series that's been on uh, on the app, The Chosen. If you've been watching that, it, it's an amazing series, and I highly recommend it. But in season one, there were eight episodes, and in season two, we're now already up to episode six. But, but one of the episodes shows the pool of Bethesda and the lame person that's healed there. And when as Jesus gets near the pool and all the Pharisees have their eyes on him, you know what they're all looking at? What's he going to do? Is he going to heal that person? Because it's actually still the Sabbath. And in fact, Matthew, Peter, and John are with Jesus. And Matthew's super nervous because he's like, holy cats, he better not go down there and heal him before the Sabbath's over because we're going to all get in trouble. And he even says to Jesus, hey, you know, you don't you think you ought to wait a few minutes? And, and, and it's amazing. Jesus turns to him and he says, you know what? I like to stir things up. Wasn't Jesus always stirring things up? Wasn't he always testing the laws that the Pharisees had compounded, these extra rules and the things that, that made things look good on the outside but really weren't coming from the heart. And so when you talk about these things, when you look at these things, it makes me think of the next three verses in Matthew 23. And I'm going to read from the message, and here's what it says. It says, their lives, and it's talking about the Pharisees, are perpetual fashion shows. They live to be noticed by others. They're embroidered prayer shawls one day and flowery prayers the next. They love to sit at the head of the table at church dinners, basking in the most prominent power positions, preening in the radiance of public flattery and praise, receiving honorary degrees, and basically receiving honor, and getting called doctor and reverend, or maybe if you're Jewish rabbi. And what's being said here by Jesus is they're concerned about the outside. That's why Jesus called the whitewashed tombs when he was speaking about these Pharisees. And when you've taken on the weight of religion, when you've taken on these extra rules, these extra things that you think are going to make you right with God, maybe it's how you dress when you go to church. Maybe it's what kind of movies you watch, what kind of music you listen to. If you think these extra rules are going to make you right with God, you can end up with the weight of religion on you. And here's how that goes. The weight of religion... If you hear it, or if you're carrying that, you're going to grow frustrated. You're going to begin to say, you know, hey, you know, I, I just, I, I'm just done with this. I mean, I, I can't be perfect. You're going to feel exhausted because when you're trying to fulfill some of these rules and regulations, it's just going to peter you out. I mean, they're going to be impossible standards to live by. Or you're going to fake it until you can't anymore. You're going to try to make it look good on the outside. You're going to try to, to, to act good in front of other people, but really that's not where your heart's at. You're going to end up conceited, and when you're conceited, you're going to compare down to people. You're going to basically say, hey, you know what? I've been tithing. I noticed you didn't put anything in the bucket. Or, hey, I, I noticed you weren't at church two weeks ago, or, or you missed Bible study, or, or you missed the small group. I mean, in other words, you're measuring things that, that are maybe making you look better. But don't forget, in Proverbs Solomon said pride goes before a fall. 
Or maybe you end up defeated because you're comparing up to others. You're looking at other people and you're just saying, I could just never be the Christian they are. One of my favorite scriptures is in Matthew 11, 28 and 29, when Jesus says, come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, because I believe we've all been there at one point or another in our lives. And here's what it says in the message. It says, are you tired? Are you weary? Are you worn out, burdened, burned out on religion? Then you need to come to Jesus. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you, I'll teach you how to take a real rest, a Sabbath rest that Hebrews 4 talks about. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. What an amazing phrase. Where we're actually focused on what Jesus has done for us rather than what we do. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. In other words, you'll get uninstitutionalized. You'll not be burdened because you've lost the sight of how to live free. And when you're set free by Jesus, you have to also learn to live free. Because that's why Jesus said this. He said that we need to learn to live free because if we don't, we're going to live with fawat, which is the fear of what others think. And I think we've probably all been there in one way, shape, or form in our life in some circumstance where you're concerned about what other people think rather than what reality is. You're, you're more concerned about the outward appearance like the Pharisees were. And here's some of the symptoms that you might have for what? Fear of what others think. You go along, but you secretly resent it. You've been going to church with your wife, but you don't really want to go there. You, you want to be home watching the Super Bowl. You want to be home watching the NFL game. You're missing the first quarter. You change your opinion based on others. In other words, you're swayed by the opinions of others. You don't have that deep connection with Jesus where you're following him. You're following the crowd. You're afraid of how others see you. You, you basically are more concerned about that outward appearance. What, what Jesus said to the Pharisees was a whitewashed tomb. He said there's nothing on the inside. And you begin to lose sight of the inner man. You're afraid of how others see you. And when you're afraid of how others see you, that can, that can really cause problems. And you can even begin to read into what other people say or do. In other words, you begin to see ghosts. You begin to feel like, oh, oh they must not like me, or oh, they must think I'm this or think I'm that. Because you're insecure in that. Because you have that fear of what others are thinking. You struggle to say no or ask for help. You are critical of others. And, and that's just a smokescreen. Because you're trying to put the attention on others so that the attention is actually not sitting on you. And you stop fo focusing on doing what God wants and you start focusing on what you're doing that other people want in your life. In other words, instead of focusing on the fact that what God has done for you, you're focusing on what you're going to do to look good to others. And here's the deal, because God doesn't love that way. God doesn't love you because of what you do. He loves you because of who you are. He is that father. He is the father that's looking on the road. He's waiting for the prodigal son to come home. He's waiting for us to turn and come to him as our source. Because God doesn't love you more. He doesn't love you more if you've never committed adultery. He doesn't love you more if you've never had an abortion. He doesn't love you more if you've, if you've never been addicted. He, he doesn't love you more if you dress moderately. He doesn't love you more if, if you're generous, if you're a tither. He doesn't love you more if you're a worship leader or a pastor or a great preacher or a great, uh, you know, a great counselor or an elder. That does not cause God to love you more. He loves you just the way you are. He is the eyes. He is the Father's eyes looking on the road waiting for you to come home. That's the love of God. It's not love because you earned it. And in order to be unchained from religion, in order to be able to do that, we need to stop thinking about earning God's favor, about doing to be right with God. And Paul had to address this with the Galatians. It wasn't just the author of Hebrews that was addressing this. When you read Paul's letters, in particular to the Galatians, he was concerned about the fact that they were going back to the law to be right with God. They, they were walking away from his grace, and here's how he puts it in the message. He said, I tried keeping rules and working my head off to please God, and it didn't work. So I quit being a lawman, as in the Mosaic Law, so that I could be God's man. 
Christ or Jesus' life showed me how and enabled me to do it. I identified myself completely with him, with Jesus. Indeed, I have been crucified with Christ. And my, eager, my ego excuse me, is no longer central. It is no longer important that I appear righteous before you. In other words, the outward appearance or have your good opinion. And I am no longer driven to impress God by doing good things. Christ now lives in me. The life you see me living is not mine, but it is lived by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You see, Paul is saying, I now find my identity in Jesus. I don't find my identity in, in doing good things, in, in following the list of law. I've, I've, I've basically been buried to the law. I've been buried with Christ when he was hung on the cross. In the life that I now live, I live by faith following him. That, that's a kind of reversal that it happened in Paul where he was now unburdened. And why try to depend on the acceptance of other people or the standards that a church's rules have put on you in order to be right with God? Why, why rely on people who are also broken, just like you are, to be right with God? Why not quit worrying about that kind of acceptance and receive what Jesus has already done for you? Because you see, ultimately, religion says do, and Jesus says done. That's the difference between religion and Jesus. Because some of you might have said when I started this message, well, isn't religion a good thing? You know, wh why would we want to not be religious? Why would it be a weight on your shoulder that you would want to throw off? I hope that you understand that now, that religion can be a weight that we need to get off of our shoulders, that we need to unhinder ourselves with. And in fact, if, if, you weak, if you're reading the Discovery Bible Studies, and you've probably already read four chapters, the first four chapters of Hebrews. In this week's chapter, in Hebrews 5, it talks about Jesus as the great high priest. And it talks about the fact that he has made a once and for all sacrifice for us. He's greater than all high priests because his sacrifice remains forever. What he did on the cross for you and for I. He, and basically it says that he's the author of our salvation. We don't need to work our way into being right with God. We don't need to work our way into being justified with God because Jesus has done that for us. We, we need to learn how to live free by taking on ourselves what Jesus has done for us already and then begin to follow him, to be, begin to obey him, not because we're obeying some law, but because we love him and because we want to be obedient to what he tells us to do out of love in our heart. And Father, I pray that you would be with us all and that you would unhinder us with religion. Any of us that have any kind of rules-based things that we're carrying on our backs, any kind of guilt or any kind of not measuring up, any kind of concern about the outward appearance, I pray you would remove that and that we would know that in our heart you have saved us. You have already done the work for us. And that now we need to follow you, that we need to follow you not outwardly, but inwardly from the heart and obey what you tell us to do because we love you. In Jesus' name, amen.